Hi everyone, welcome back to 33 Founders. You've chosen a very informative and healthy day to be with us because I'm here with Taro Isocopula. Did I get that? Yeah, it went well. Close enough, okay. Yeah. The co-founder of Four Sigma Foods. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. You've said before, Taro, that the food industry has a lot of noise, but not a lot of depth. So I wanna start out with you just diving into what Four Sigma Foods is and what you guys are trying to accomplish. Sure, um, we wanna help people eat healthier and we wanna take ancient wisdom and bring it to the modern times. So roughly half of the world's population right now live in modern settings and I think there's a lot of ancient knowledge and ancient wisdom that we can bring to the modern life. I, obviously you cannot do it the exactly same way as the cavemen did it, but you can take some of the wisdom there and just apply it in a different way. So that's what we want to do and help people eat healthier. Um, what Four Sigma is, is a very kiki way of saying that uh, we only represent like the top 50 most researched foods in the world. So in any science, including natural science, if you take large enough sample size, it's probably going to form a natural distribution a bell curve and then just four standard deviations from the mean. So it's a very geeky way of saying that we, we focus on the most studied and, and most covered, you know, I guess superfoods in the world and just try to bring them in a more convenient, easy way to the people. Yeah, so let's go right into the teas and the hot chocolate then. Feel free to start with the hot chocolate because everyone loves chocolate. Sure. So I, if I take one step back, we're mostly known for our mushroom products. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm originally from Finland, so a lot of people call us the Finnish fun guys. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's... It's, so that's the first thing that we want to kind of help popularize and democratize is the consumption of mushrooms. And uh, why mushrooms is, well, A, it's a kingdom. It's like plants and animals. So I think fungi and bacteria have suffered from food racism quite a lot in the last mm -hmm. few years. So um, there, we are, humans are almost half the same DNA as mushrooms and we can utilize a lot of the mushrooms health beneficial things. And actually we do because uh, about half of the top best-selling drugs are derived from fungi. So, so they're really good for our health, especially our immune system and our hormonal balance. And, and kind of like the challenge why they haven't been used widely is that they're very difficult to use because the good mushrooms grow on trees and they're sturdy matter. Like um, I have actually here one of my favorites. It's uh, called chaga. grows on birch tree in a few cool. countries around the world. It's hard. It's like it's really, really hard. And so you cannot eat it. So you have to boil it and then put it in an alcohol to extract these, uh, you know, health beneficial compounds. So it takes several weeks, so it's been hard to do. And then the second part is that they're very bitter, uh, usually on the flavor. So what we've tried to do is kind of pre-boil and pre-do them for people in, in these teas or hot chocolates. Mm -hmm. Because also hot chocolate, cacao, and things like coffee are very bitter by nature. So we try to take these like familiar flavors and then bring add the kind of hide and the mushrooms in um, but yeah that's that's what we do we have a few different kinds of products some help with sleep quality some help with sexual drive some help with um, sport performance but mostly with common modern day problems like stress and you know natural performance and it's literally this big that's the packet yeah I don't have one right now oh, do I uh, yep here Perfect. Let me grab so so they look like this, like here's lion's mane. And so you just add hot water. So we wanted to, you know, kind of emulate things that people already do and how they consume it. And we wanted to give like jump a generation. So think of like, think of like Africa and a lot of countries in Africa never had landlines to call, right? Mm -hmm. I'm from, I'm originally from a place called Nokia, Finland. So I love all the telephone examples, but like, uh, <laughs> they didn't have landlines. And, but now they jump straight into like mobile phone technology, even like at some places 4G technology, so LTE. So you jump like one generation because there's no point of building this uh, technology that is already dated. Yeah, of course. So what we think is like people can jump straight from like whatever Walmart, instant coffee, instant tea type of things to the kind of the best ever. So you go from the worst ever to the best ever um, if as long as the consumption is as, as super simple as possible and the flavor is nice and, you know, I think people are willing to do it. We have a long way to go, but I think that's the journey we're on. So do you have a favorite flavor? Um, 
Yeah, I do. I, but it's kind of like if you would have several kids and you would that's ask, what I was what's your favorite? Like <laughs> yeah. You can't have a favorite flavor. Um, but, you know, just to be 100% fr- you know, honest, I, I think as a personality, I have a lot of energy and I've chosen a path to help people live healthier in modern settings and leave off family farm where I can just like shower in spring water mm-hmm. and to live in, like right now I'm in LA, before that I was living in New York. So in this environment, I need more grounding. And for me, reishi, which is the fourth most studied food in the world, mm-hmm. um, and the most studied mushroom, the kind of the queen of the mushrooms, which is really stress-reducing, um, that's the one I like the most, I guess. So Dara, why, why I was researching for Sigma Foods, like I was telling you before we got on, I couldn't get over the social engagement and yep. your team's response to it. So all I could think of was, I got to figure out the person behind this social media marketing. Lucky for me. It's you. So can you? Well, well I, I, I can say, I'm, I mean, I did the marketing in the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, but we have a great team. Um, we have three guys. So I'm, I'm heading the company now um, and we have a great marketing team. So I cannot take the credit. I think it's just, you know, a group of people who like, we truly do care what we do. We've chosen to leave, you know, our jobs that were like kind of more conventional, high paid jobs. Mm-hmm to do something that we love and I think you know we walk the talk so I think that's hopefully what comes out through our communication um, but yeah I definitely cannot take the credit I'm sorry I think so. you I think you can take a little bit of credit because it's the whole feeling of four sigma foods and one of the things I recently learned from Luke Sherwin over at Casper in New York is that the smartest companies and the most intuitive companies talk to their customers after they buy the product so yeah. you're not just selling people to buy the packet of tea, you're talking to them after. And going on Instagram, going on Twitter, I can really see how people are engaged. So once someone posts their breakfast with the packet, what's your natural response? Well, I think these days it's slightly different depending on the channel because the channel where they post it, is it Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, is slightly different Um kind of context I guess context is mm-hmm. the first thing but definitely I mean I'm stoked I'm like <laughs> I'm, even like after now selling several millions of these packets and whatnot it's still like I'm super excited to see people using mushrooms um obviously some of our fans are regular so there's a pre-existing conversation but if it's a new one I you know definitely definitely high five them sometimes I ask what's the favorite flavor um also like where did they buy it or how did they find it i think that's the most fascinating part is like where did the relationship start and then uh, obviously if we can build on it um so what's the initial feedback on that particular product can it have they tried other products and also how can we make it better and often they do have questions on very specific questions on like okay where is your chaga from like mm-hmm. Um, which most of the stuff is on the website, but you know, some people haven't gone to the website with a thorough detail. They might have found it in a juice bar or something like that. So, so that's probably the conversation where we start, but uh, there is no real formula except we want to answer everybody within 24 hours. And even if we don't have an answer, we're going to answer and say that we don't have an answer yet. We're going to figure it out. And, you know, um, but usually, yeah, we're pretty responsive and, um, yeah, we have a whole team of answering these. So, uh, but everybody's part of part of the owners and mm-hmm. and found, you know part of the founding team. So they, it's really their company in a way. So I guess that comes through as well. So, regardless, I love that you said you know now this is in so many different places. You've sold millions of packs, but you still get that same excitement when someone says, "Hey, I yeah. just tried it and I love it." As you bring on more people to the team, how do you make sure that they're going to respond with that same excitement? That's a very good question, and that's the thing that I didn't know when I founded this company was how important culture is. I mean, in theory, yes, I've read like some startup books and whatever that said it, but you only realize it as as things go. And and we're a virtual team, so our one of our premises was that oh, this should be free, and freedom should be part of our core values. Mm-hmm. So, for example, our, one of our marketing guys is living in Tel Aviv, and he likes to live there, and then. Some of us, you know, travel a lot. So our head of marketing, uh, Marcus, he, he used to spend quite a lot of time in Bali. Um, so in that way, it is, it is difficult. Um, a lot of the people we started out with, I've known for a long time. We'd ha- I, I founded this sport club back in the day, which premise was to 
help adults find new sports. So, because for a lot of adults, there was no really one sport they could do. Um, so, kind of a sport club that didn't have a sport that it was trying different stuff, and then you could find your what what you Very love. Cool. So I met a lot of those people back in the day then, and so we've had a long relationship. Now that new people come, it's mostly through friends or some kind of a reference, and then getting to know process that could last up to like nine months, and just hanging out and you know getting to know each other before you know you really make the call. Uh, but definitely, culture is a huge thing, and uh, it would be very hard for us to hire someone who who's not equally passionate about the lifestyle. Obviously, not everybody is an expert in mushrooms and they don't have mm-hmm. to be. But, you know, the care for the customer and the the kind of love for that should be there. So that's something I just heard too from Chris Saka that you can become known in an industry simply by being nice to people. So, yes. <laughs> as you know, as you take that into your culture, it's, it's very apparent on your social channels on the website that I could easily inquire about a question I had. So how did you get in the beginning brand evangelists? What do you mean by brand evangelists? So how did you get the, because there's, you guys even have a page on your website dedicated to people who love Four Sigma Foods, who use it. How did you get them to sign on with you guys? Not necessarily sign on, but to join the movement. Um... Uh, that's a very good question. I think everybody has a little bit of an own story. Um, if I would break it down to three different elements, it is, you know, uh, first and foremost, um, like initially, it's a lot of hustle. So, like, but it is easy to hustle when you love something. Like, if before I started this company, and still today, I'm promoting, like, a lot of other brands, products that I love. Like, yesterday, I was meeting with, um, you know, a chef or a celebrity trainer and whatever, and I was promoting, like, three other brands that... I have no affiliation too because just um, I love them, right? So that's one. Like you definitely need to be there. And we've traveled not only to the farms uh, but also to meet people everywhere. So, you know, that that's one thing. The second part is that we have products that truly work. Mm-hmm. Um, I was frustrated by using a lot of herbal botanicals because they didn't give you noticeable results, either because of low quality or low therapeutic dosage. So I had to spend, you know, six weeks eating a product to get a noticeable result. And that's why, by the way, I think why coffee, people love coffee, is because it's one of the only plant, plant extracts, because what it is, it's coffee being extracted into a beverage where you actually get a noticeable result. So people love that feeling that in, in the modern day world, you want instant gratification. So um, wanted that. So once you just sample and seed products, uh, we have a couple products, especially where people are like, holy <laughs> crap, I'm like, I've not had this and I'm not going to very... Uh, long, we have a lot, tons of stories, but one of my favorites is there's this prominent American business person, um, over 60, uh, had certain health issues, uh, kind of mental, uh, cognitive related things. And I gave another product, and I gave also our product Cordyceps, which is for natural energy, uh, which has a nickname called Cordyceps. So it's kind of like used as a natural Viagra in some countries, and 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 just uh, randomly. A, he, he had uh, positive experiences in, in his body that he hadn't had for over 10 years. So That's great. he becomes a brand evangelist if something like that happens. So the second part is just having products that work. And then third is uh, caring. Um, and this might sound really funny, but also a lot of our team members are, you know, we're, we're originally from Finland and, you know, Nordic. So it's, it's also like for us, uh, not doing just what we love, but also like having a uh, customer service mentality and truly caring for the people. And, and we build a lot of good fr- relationships and friendships from our customers. And it, that's a thing that like in the modern tech world, especially in startup world, everything must scale. But, you know, human interaction is one of the things that there's certain things that don't need to scale and probably won't scale. And, you know, caring for customers needs to be there. And then if you want it to scale, the way to scale it is just getting more people who are customer service oriented. So I think that's pretty huge. I love it. And aside from the social aspect of just interacting with people or even being an evangelist for other brands, what are some of the things that you guys do that don't scale for your customers that have really built a community? Uh, sending them gifts that we draw by hand, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, or uh, calling them or... Um, I don't know. We've done quite a lot of stuff, uh, you know, 
I think there's quite a lot. I just like holding private events. That's about private health consulting, not just related to our products. There's quite a few things that don't scale, actually. Obviously, we're not going to keep on doing all of them all the time. <clears throat> depends on the situation and the feedback we get from them. Um, but yeah, there's quite a few of those things. So you would say then that that's been a huge part of your success so far? Um, yeah, I could say that. Uh, granted, I have to say that not all of them has worked, and the work that they we've ab- and work for me means that we've been able to create significant value add for. Our- mm-hmm. So we've done like free eBooks, uh, like long research things like you can find them on our website. Um, from all the basic superfoods and studies on them and share them for free. And we don't sell even like just maybe 20% of all those things. So it's like a lot of stuff that we just believe in. We've made a lot of videos, educational stuff, interviewed people, all kinds of those things, um, especially in the early ages. And I'm, I'm sure like it, it contributed, but not all of them were like successful in the way that people found them super, super useful. Mm-hmm. But we did them still, so... So do you have a balance of doing things that don't scale when you're going? So let's say you guys have won a new customer service initiative and you're just trying to think of what it is. Do you try to take that lean startup model and start out with something small and test it to see how people like it? Maybe have like a small private health consulting thing and then say, hey, people love this. Let's do it more often. Yeah, technically, yes. But it, it comes down from customer feedback, I think. A lot of those ideas, we've had great ideas, and, and once we've piloted them, they were not so great ideas. But the only way to find a really great idea usually is that enough many people already ask it from you. Say, like, hey, could you do this, right? So, And then you kind of do it. So um, that's the kind of things that you know we try to... Like we had, like so many customers were asking about our testing, like how do we test our products? Because mm-hmm. we were... I, to my knowledge, we're like one of the only companies, if not the only company, who tests certain parameters like aflatoxins, which are these type of mycotoxins. So we test mushrooms for mushrooms, <laughs> and, which is really funny. And to make it even more careful, a lot of our mushrooms are antifungal. So they're good against candida and things like that. That's so great. they're mushrooms that are anti-mushrooms that we test that they don't have mushrooms in them. So, so a lot of that. So we made this quality manual that we you know, send it to our ambassadors and things like that. So it was after like a good 50 people were asking and we were individually replying to them. And I was like, you know, why do we individually reply to them? Why don't we just make a super detailed package of all this and ship mm-hmm. it, you know, email it or something like that. So um, I think that's a good way of just listening to consumers. I think we could be better at it, uh, but that's the kind of way we've rolled so far. So far. So that actually goes right into my next question, which is one from of our which is from one of our audience members, Sierra, who wants to know how you guys test your recipes because there's a great blog post about it. Can you run us through that process? Sure. So, I mean, first we start with good ingredients and then it has to be um, backed up by science and also cultural historical use. So it has to be modern day research, but also has to have several, you know, tens and generations of detailed use. And then we look at it from a function point of view is like, what does the research say? What is it good for? And then you build a recipe using this kind of ancient formulation method. So it's good to know that no herb was individually used in a common way. So even in coffee, which is a herb or tea, normally you would combine it with a few other things. So, um, cause it's like a delivery system in a way. So we use usually between, you know, four to six ingredients so we use a main herb, which in our, a lot of our products is actually a mushroom. Then we use a supporting herb that does the same thing uh, from a different angle. And then we use balancing herbs so it's not going to hit yourself head in the hammer with having a too strong of a product. So it helps with digestion. Like, for example, we use rosehip with our mushrooms mm-hmm. because rosehip is a natural source of vitamin C. And vitamin C, especially in a natural complex form, um, will help... Um, improve the digestive process of these polysaccharides in the mushrooms, you know, six to nine times even. So basically that's how we look at it from an ancient formulation method. A lot of this stuff is, is written down, especially in the Ayurvedic and the Chinese medicinal systems. There's a long tradition of formulation. But if you dig deeper, I mean, also the Japanese, the Russians, the Amazonian systems. The Amazonian is probably the most complex, but it's also the least documented one because they didn't write down stuff like the Chinese did. But to the point is, uh, we look at it from both a Western point of view and then an, an Eastern point of view. And then we, our, our chef and uh, product manager, 
we'll do these different recipes and we'll test them with our community. Uh, like right now, we're going to launch a new product in a couple months. So we've been going through different kinds of testing, both for flavor and the efficacies. Mm -hmm. And then we send it to a lab in Germany where they go through like the basic parameters. Obviously, some of our farm, like quite all, pretty much all of our farms, will also run like a certificate of analysis. So they do also lab. Wow. So it, it's a pretty long process, but it's not like we're reinventing formulation. It's rather using ancient formulations and just bringing them to flavors and use cases that are suitable for modern living. I know you guys have a trusted group of users too who you do the initial tests on to see what they think. Yep. How did you get that group together? Um, I mean, it's building those relationships. Uh, and look, it's like nutrition is slightly different than, let's say, building an app. App, one, you have digital distribution, so you can distribute it like this. So if you go from one user to a million, as long as you can get it down, it's very fast. Also, <clears throat> it's less personal. Like, let's assume that you have a, now I heard about an app where you can call in a, a tow truck, like with pump pressing app. Really? So like, yeah, I, so it's, it's up and coming. So the thing is, that, or Uber, let's call, use Uber, right? So there's less of a personal relationship with, the, with calling a cab unless your dad was a cab driver, right? Mm -hmm. But everybody has a super, super, super personal relationship with food. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of information on food and nutrition especially. So should you eat high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat? Is animal protein good for you? Is animal protein bad for you? So it do comes down to the fact of like who do you trust and who do you have that relationship with? And so us helping some person recommend it to another person where there's a reference. Um, and because in the first two years when we started, we, like, we really had zero marketing budget as well. So we built those personal relationships with help us, you know, um, build that community. Again, like we're only really starting to expand that community, but we do have quite a big uh, trusted group of very professional people as well. So people have been a long time in this industry helping us out with our mission. And obviously we're probably one of the only ones who have this like wider democratization, popularization mission around mushrooms. So I think that's also sets us apart a little bit. So now that you guys, so let's say you've gone past a tested group of user, it's great. You launch the product. Yeah. A lot of times with food, it's going to be, like you said, it's a very personal relationship. So either you love it or you don't like it. Yeah. So you have a lot of people posting on social media. I love it. I'm having it for breakfast. How about the people then who don't like it? Do you reach out to them? Do you change the recipe? What feedback do you use and which do you say, you know what, this isn't relevant right now? I think that's a, that's a great question. I think constructive or negative feedback is one of the best things you can have, especially early stages. And luckily for us, mushrooms taste awful as they are. So it's like, especially if you make them in an efficient, like, effective way so you actually don't grow them in laboratory a lot of the products on the market are grown labs there ours is never from the lab always from the nature and if you if you build them right they're, they're really bad tasting right i mean there's a like i'm now in venice beach there's a there's a community who will love that flavor right so there is an <laughs> but it's a small niche so for us it was easy because the starting point is that they're awful and then how we built from there that they're Good. So, like, any everybody in our team has the expectations that they will, you know, have this dialogue, dialogue uh, around the flavor, and also how to like people to understand to give them a shot, to give mushrooms a chance, because the first impression is that uh, oh, a they're shrooms, so they're like, I I'm gonna trip on it, or they're like portobello mushrooms, and I hate that flavor. I don't like mushroom taste, so why would I drink it? <laughs> so that's like the com That's the starting point for us. So it was for us. It was can only go up from there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, so we're used to negative feedback. And once you're used to negative feedback, it's kind of like you learn how to manage it. But also you, you build a culture where you embrace negative feedback. Whereas I think if you're only winning from day one, eventually you will get negative feedback. So that's like guaranteed. So how are you going to deal with that? Is the, is the company culture ready for constructive criticism or not? And because the mushrooms taste really bad and they gross out so many people, for us, luckily, we have a culture of like used to getting negative feedback and then building from there. So, uh, which also helped us formulate, even though we didn't have initial competition really in that space, we we're like the first ones to make these mushrooms into a, an, something else than a capsule. We still could formulate like super fast and innovate super fast because we had that feedback. 
So we went from a bad tasting product to a really good tasting product in, in a way faster time than I think a lot of other uh, companies would, would have done in this space. When you say you have a culture that is ready for negative feedback, what does that mean? Are you telling your team something? Is that just from day one? You're going to hire me and you're going to say, hey, Jenna, listen, people don't really have that great of a reception when you say, hey, you want to try mushroom tea? Yeah, that, that's one. Um, I mean, interview process you can build on, kind of set the stage for the culture, mm -hmm. but interview is an interview and then reality is reality. And I think it comes down to, uh, to the founder or founders and the management team is how they behave. And I think uh, Nordic people are fairly critical, self-critical. And, you know, that's probably set at the stage that we're also very critical. And we pretty openly discuss the, the, the weaknesses that we have. Um, so I think it comes down to daily things. Like you have to walk the talk. You can, mm -hmm. you can talk as much as you want. I also love to show this one YouTube uh, video of George Carlin, uh, stand-up comedy on like saving the planet and like setting the stage with that. So it's part of that like interview mm -hmm. process is like also being able to laugh at yourself and understanding that probably, you know, the planet is smarter than us and, you know, we're not going to save the planet. <laughs> so so that's, that's just, you know, small thing. But I want to shift gears for a couple of minutes and talk about sales. Sure. You guys have a web store and then you also have your product in other stores. You have it in big retailers or like you said, just in a juice bar. What was it like having those initial conversations, pitching someone to say, hey, carry Four Sigma in your store? And that was hard. That was <laughs> hard. First and foremost, like we had a mentality of born global. Mm -hmm. So we started with the principle of doing a niche and doing it better than anybody else in the world. Um, so we sell in retail, I think now in 22 countries, mm -hmm. and then we sell direct to about 40 countries mm -hmm. of consumers. Um, obviously, our focus now is in, in the US and North America, and so that's our like focus uh, for, for the last few months. But you know, there's a starting point. It's a lot of different places, a lot of different regulation, a lot of different rules. So even just like the practicality is that if the buyer loves you, but mm -hmm. them to bring you in, it's kind of challenging. And then when you have mushrooms, a lot of buyers don't get you. They're like, what? What? And then you have to drive, like, use symbols of understanding, or like, look, mm -hmm. like 20 years ago, sushi was not a big thing either. Yeah. Right? Or kombucha is now, I think, GT's kombucha is like the best sold products in Whole Foods all over the country. So how did kombucha, which basically is a fungi as well, originally the SCOBY, so how did that become popular or coconut water or, you know, there's a million examples of things that in a very short while have caught on, but like the buyers sometimes forget them because they're focused on weekly, monthly and quarterly results. So it was hard, um, but it, it comes down to, you know, you having, you're sharing your vision and your story and then, you know, being earnest about like your intentions and then truly helping them. So once you find that person who gave you a shot is really, you know, making sure that he or she made a good decision and you helped them out. And, uh, you know, and also understanding where you will not be successful. So I don't think we will be successful in Walmart anytime soon. <laughs> you know, it's like just a simple fact that like uh, peop the, the, the market for mushrooms or soup other, this kind of like really strong superfoods is not mm -hmm. yet there. There's a lot of education to be done. And uh, so that's it as well. So the first part would be, making sure that your market, the people who want to use Four Sigma, is shopping at that location. And then the next part is when the buyer comes back to you with like mushrooms, not happening. Yeah. You give them your vision, you give them the facts, and then you assure them that, hey, we're going to help you do this. Yeah, I think you can do it both ways. I, we pushed through trade, so we could call, you could call it push marketing. For example, in, in London, there's this uh, amazing store called Planet Organic where all these like celebrities and whatever shop as well. And um, we pushed it and we created a market. Uh, so they really were not selling mushrooms. We convinced that mushrooms are cool. And with, with the support, we made that work. But in a lot of cases, it's way easier to have a, like a pool where either consumers are asking from it from their buyer mm -hmm. and, and then you bring it on. It's way easier that way. So um, both can work. But I would say that as a tip to other people, focus on the pool <laughs> and the consumer and and once the consumers you know get it and love it the trade will follow because the, the trade especially in food is slightly conservative or not slightly very conservative and slow moving so the review cycles of stores and retail the 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 rules they have the margin structures they have 
it's just you know it takes a while so um especially to build on it and especially if you don't have you're not heavily funded will be tough so i would start with the consumer and then once you have that consumer traction then it's you know everything gets easier so do you think it's better to for an early stage food entrepreneur today Oh, I should have said foodpreneur. I love that word. <laughs> Do you think it's better for them to start out online and see if they can gain traction or to try to go into a brick and mortar store? That depends on the product. Um, is it self stable? Is it lightweight, heavy? Like, is it a beverage? Is it like how? So, how is the shipping it's, itself? Mm-hmm. But I would definitely do something, even on, on, a, on a very small scale, it'd be Kickstarter or a, a farmer's market. Way you at at least get the customer feedback and you during the formulation phase. So this morning I went here in Venice to a farmers market as well, and so that would be like a place if you're a local brand or you have stuff and where you can really you know sell hands on just to make sure that you got the concept mm-hmm. right and you get that feedback um, because it's way more controllable and there's less cost involved. Um, but it depends really on the category. Some some categories are more set for retail, some are more set for online. So I don't think there is like one way of doing it. So initial farmers markets was highly beneficial for you guys then? Uh, we didn't do farmers market per se. We used more that we had like a you place know, yoga you studios. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gyms. Like a demo. Uh, yeah, basically we did tons of demos. Tons. Like I think like last year we did like 2,000 hours or something like that. And Wow. And, you know, it's, but it's, it's, it's such an odd thing. You have to give people a chance to try it mm-hmm. and, and through that also build that relationship. And that's why I think even though online is great, you know, eventually a lot of online brands will want to have a, a face-to-face relationship with, with their customers. Mm-hmm. So either they build, once they become big enough, they have like conferences or they have whatever pop-up stores. But, you know, usually, usually you want to have a personal relationship and then the online relationship will be easier as well. So. So what have you learned about doing those demos then from the first one you did to the 2000 you did last year? Yeah. Start by saying hi. No, I'm just joking. It's no, like... <laughs> but that's true though because I think sometimes whenever I'm walking past somewhere and someone's saying like, try this, try this, try this, I'm like, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, my give joke, me a second. My joke about that is uh, I went to Cambodia. We built this uh, first year. We do this charity project. So first year we were building the school in Cambodia and mm-hmm. in the... I was in, in the Angkor Wat area, which is like this old temple town near Siem Reap. And there's these kids coming, selling to you. And they only yell, $1, $1, $1, $1. So they don't greet you. They don't take you into consideration. But they also don't tell you what they're what selling. They're just gonna <laughs> so I'm like, okay, the price, I get it. It's $1. What do I get for it? So, um, yeah. But that's kind of a, as a joke. You start with the high. Um, I, I think for flavor, uh, we've figured out certain flavors that are more palatable, more you know, easygoing, especially in the beginning, um, which work and what's the temperature of the water that makes it taste better because our product is bioavailable in both cold and hot water. Um, but if you're not used to the flavor, um, even though it's not a bad flavor, it's an acquired taste. It's the same way as if you give it to a kid a, a cup of coffee probably going to be like oh, I don't know about this you know <laughs> it's like if you give me a cup of coffee that's what I'm going to say so yeah and it, it's and it's also is it black is it with almond milk did you put sugar in it well, how did you use it did you put it in a cho- you know an ice cream you know there's all this like so kind of getting used to certain things so I think those demos helped us with that and also how did they find us what were their favorites um and how did they use them for example Originally, we all, all only said, you know, add it to, to, to hot water and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And people started making desserts with, with the mushrooms. They started putting them in different kinds of smoothies. So then we started getting recipes from our consumers. Mm-hmm. And then we put them on the website like, hey, do you want to make a raw chocolate that is really brain boosting? Maybe you want to try this one. Okay, like, ooh. And then, um, you know, that, that's kind of like listening to the consumers as well. So really, you're having a conversation, even from the earliest days to someone who's become an evangelist for the brand, you're having a conversation, you're learning as much from them, like you said, you're getting the recipe as they are getting from you. Well, hopefully. I, I mean, obviously online, so much is happening, and mm-hmm. we try to scan a lot of different you know, forums and places like where people talk about our product. Obviously, when they add us or tag us, you know, that's the easiest way of mm-hmm. us, us figuring it out, but there's so much going on. So, you know, some things might go past us, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's our goal. And then, you know, try to build that relationship. 
And obviously, some consumers don't want to build a relationship, which is fine yeah, as well. But I, I think surprisingly many, especially with food, are curious and is like, where did the food come from and who made it and why, why was it made that way and what are the intentions behind it? And, you know, so I think most people want to have that relationship. So. All right, Tara, just a couple more questions for you. Sure. One of the things that you guys did was go to Excel Foods, a great food startup accelerator in New York. And we've had Jordan and Lauren on the show before. Why would you recommend that other food startups seek a program like Excel Foods or Excel Foods? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you look at the tech world, I think a lot of the, the success for multiple different companies and products can be explained also with the existing infrastructure of you know, finance, distribution, support, mentorship. So as a, as, a, as a tech community, they build a model where they harness innovation and we, you know, to make this world a better place, we knew, need new ways or kind of reinvent the ways how we're doing things. So um, for food, especially, it is such a complicated industry. So if you, that's what I always say, like people go to like, they shop at Whole Foods, they shop somewhere and they're like, ooh, I love to make this kind of a product. Like everybody says my, you know, chia seed porridge is the best, which might be true, right? But it is you, hard. It, but you look at it from a consumer's point of view and you're like, oh, I make it. But what if you start to make it at the store? There's so many moving parts from, we've only talked here, distribution, lab testing, but also, mm -hmm. you know, invoicing. All, there's all kinds of different irregal, like different odd things. And food is such a big industry and it's such a primal need for us. There's also a lot of barriers of entry. And so a lot of the large companies I'm not going to name them, but, you know, they, they have built these barriers of entry. So it's really, really like the first sec and the second fence you have, which you have to cross are super, super high. Obviously with the internet, they're getting lower, but it's extremely difficult. So then working with people like Excel Foods who've, you know, done it and they know the people who do it um, helps you to get hooked up with a lot of things and, you know, tap into the, both the tacit knowledge and the best practices of the field and partner up with the right people. Because eventually, whatever size company you are, you need to partner up. Um, there's no way everybody's going to do everything in-house from packaging to whatever. So you need good partners. Who are those? You know, that's for you to find out. But using a platform like Excel Foods helped us a lot uh, in, in building, you know, a more solid thing. And even though consumers don't care who is your shipping provider, exactly. they do care that they get it on time and in the right way. So eventually that will, you know, improve the customer experience as well. Tara, my last question for you is one that I'm going to end every 33 Founders episode with this season. I've become very fascinated by uncertainty, facing it, and overcoming it. I just graduated from school and met quarter-life crises, and I don't like them. So I, yeah. figure out, I want to figure out how to leave them behind. You guys yeah. have had your hot chocolate product ready for two years, but you had to hold off because of some complexities. How did you deal with the uncertainty of not knowing if something so great, ready, that people loved was going to come to life? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very good question. And that's um, kind of what I like to call inner work. So you have to do work within yourself and kind of like know your mission is why do you do what you do? Mm -hmm. And that's huge. So what, when you know why do you do stuff, it gets way easier to manage with the nitty gritty details. And this is my personal experience, obviously, it might be different for other people, but um, I mean, there's two balancing forces. There is, you know, fear of losing or fear of something that will happen, right? And then there's the joy and the happiness of getting and creating, right? And, and different people are slightly balanced differently. So they're more fear-driven or more joy-driven. So um, I think you just have to ask those questions from yourself and have that conversation with yourself. Um, there's different tools. Like I'm more... Uh, sometimes like leaning towards the fear and I think you know in that way I look at like what's the worst thing that can happen and that helped me is looking at like well actually it's not going to go too bad and also like facing the facts that like we're going to die like that's also a good conversation to have with yourself is like look you're going to die you're going to have a life and you go from you know A to B if you go to straight line it, it's fine and dandy you don't have any big ups you don't have any big downs Versus going up and down, even if you're more down, if, if you don't think of it from as an A or B, but look at the journey as a, a string, and at the end, you take the edges, ends of the string and you pull it, and the more you have ups and downs, the longer you have your life. So that's how I looked at it. 
So accepting the fact that I'm going to die and, you know, the ups and downs are okay, that helped me go through. But I'm sure some people will be more motivated by understanding the, the final impact. And for me, it, it's also been going towards that direction that we've had like people who've been extremely severely sick and received help from our products or, or just found like, uh, oh, how do we do things really inspiring? So meeting those people in person and seeing the impact you have uh, helps you go through adversity. So, um, but it is difficult, but you know, everything, a lot of things in life are, are difficult. So, you know, why spend energy on it? So. Where did you get that string metaphor? That's one of the best I've heard. Did you come up with that? I don't remember. So you take, probably, credit, pro- take credit I, for it now. Take credit. <laughs> probably every thought everybody says is not novel at all. So we probably stole it from our grandparents. So stories are a way how we've learned things before we had internet and books. So probably stories go long, 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 long time ago. So well, in my but, book, you're going to get credit for it. Oh, that thank was pretty, you. That was pretty spectacular. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And thanks for having me. And uh, if I have a final request, if, if, if you're interested, give mushrooms a chance. <laughs> it's a kingdom. You need to give, <laughs> give them an opportunity and see if you become friends with them. So. And everyone can stay updated with you guys on Twitter, at Four Sigma Foods. And then it's the same handle on Instagram, right? Yeah, and Facebook as well. And we have this, um, if you're interested in general about being a food entrepreneur or foodpreneur and stuff like that, every month we send uh, kind of an insider where we share not only health tips, but also kind of what, what's been going on. And we've been doing it for the day we started. So I personally write like what's going on and like very openly also about the adversities that we just talked about. Um, so if you're interested in our journey, you know, you can sign up to this uh, monthly insider as well. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. You too.